Hey folks, so I actually didn't realize that the theme of the morning was going to be so exclusively focused on journalism, which is this? Okay. Uh, but, but that's, but that's uh, where we are, which is great, because I'm an ex-journalist myself. Um, I'm going to let these two gentlemen introduce themselves, and then uh, each of us are going to make some introductory remarks, and then we're going to have a conversation about what it takes to get these tools that we all see the obvious application of to journalism actually into the hands of working journalism in a way that makes sense. Um, so uh, introduce yourselves first, and then we'll, we'll jump in. OK. Uh, th thanks. I'm uh, Dan Gilmore. I'm, I, I live here in the Bay Area. I'm director of something new at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. It's called the News Collab, and we're working on uh, collaborative experiments, mostly focused on the demand side of the supply-demand equation, and thinking about how we can uh, elevate, especially community information ecosystems. Uh, and we're working with newsrooms in four cities around the country, as well as on a uh, science and health uh, misinformation uh, experiment with educators. So the, the newsroom project involves uh, work helping the newsrooms do these uh, news literacy kinds of things in part by persuading them and helping them be more transparent in a very radical way as well as community conversation and collaboration at a very deep level. That's our approach to it and so annotation uh, which is, has always fascinated and I've been hanging around this community for a long time, feels like it's going to be a really important part. And when I discuss it a little further, uh, making it important involves some uh, things that I'm going to plead with you folks to do. Hi, my name is Jonathan Stray. Uh, I'm at Columbia Journalism School, where I teach the double master's degree in computer science and journalism. And uh, my background is both. Uh, I spent 10 years out here in the Valley as a computer scientist at Adobe. Uh, and then I moved to Hong Kong, got a journalism degree, and ended up in the interactive department of the Associated Press for a while. Um, I, uh, part of my work is trying to get data journalists to make their work transparent. So how do we attach to the story some sort of record of what, they, what it was they did with the data. And I'm going to um, show you a little bit of that later. One of the big challenges, as I'm sure we'll hear a lot about, is it's very hard to get reporters to change their workflow. So I hope to talk about that. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I'm somebody who was at Byte Magazine and InfoWorld, both as a journalist and a toolsmith. Um, I've off and on over the years tried to bring uh, workflow and tool improvements into that environment, and um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about why it's so hard and why the the benefits that are obvious to everyone in this room um, that the annotation tech can bring um, are, are things that uh, you know we need to lay a foundation for that isn't there yet, I and mean, there's there's real real clear work that needs to be done, um, but. Um, Give us, the, give us the framework. OK. Um, well, let me, OK. Like John, I'm, like both of these folks, I'm a former journalist. Uh, some of you re may remember my uh, often cranky column in the San Jose Mercury News some years ago. So. I'm, I think there's, there's two things I want to just hopefully help out with. One is talk a little bit about the reality of journalism and today's newsrooms. Uh, and then the other thing is some thoughts, uh, very uh, high level stuff about how I think this could be of benefit to journalists. And I think that the people on earlier showed us uh, some terrific use cases uh, and I, I hope that we'll see more and more of those as we go. 
the, the number one reality for journalists today is basically no time, no money, and increasing pressure to get stuff done in an environment that is, uh, in almost every case, except for a few major organizations, antithetical to thinking about it. It scares me what's happening to journalism uh, and at every level, but we have to incorporate what's happening into the idea of how we're gonna add. So I, I think any new tool has to be incredibly easy to use and not disruptive of the workflow, or, or if it's going to be disruptive and high learning curve, it better produce some unbelievably spectacular new result that transcends the tool and where no one cares about the tool, but something great has happened. And, and these are both uh, possible, I think. So the day, the typical day for a journalist at a typical newsroom at this point uh, makes me realize how easy I had it when I was doing journalism in the days of, uh, well, monopolies. Being a monopoly is really fun if you're the monopolist. Uh, you have more time to do things you want. But today, these guys and girls work so hard that in ways that we just didn't have to. We could just take our time to do things. And today, the men and women at newspapers are, and, and TV and everywhere else, they're jamming stuff onto the web as fast as they can create it. And maybe once in a while having time for something longer. It's just not what it was. And what worries me is that the, the priorities from a business perspective tend to be what's quick, what gets attention, as opposed to what's deep and uh, valuable. That's a, another problem. I don't see how annotation is going to fix that. More opportunities, certainly, for people with more resources and to be at the New York Times or the Washington Post today is the ultimate in journalism uh, luxury. Uh, I, I hope we're going to come back to some of that. There are other organizations like ProPublica doing spectacular work uh, on a nonprofit model, and we need other models. The, the thing that's interesting to me about annotation, among other things, is the notion that this is an overlay on every document as opposed to uh, something built into a product like track changes in Microsoft Word, which, by the way, I think is the single most great feature about Word and helped everybody in the authoring business, now moves to the web, but I, I don't want it to be tied to any document, and that's what the new HTML standards should help do, as John has deeply explained to me. There are lots of examples I could give you of things that might be useful in annotation. I'll just give you a couple because I don't want to talk too long. But uh, he, one example is something at Talking Points Memo. Josh Marshall, who created it from a single blog uh, in 2000, now has a real big team. And he does something that's really just taking analog and putting it online. And that is he creates uh, he, he puts something on his uh, tablet, and with a pen, he writes on it, typically a PDF. And he posts these periodically, and they're really, they're, they're terrific. He's, he's annotating as if he were just scribbling on a piece of paper, and then he reposts it. And the value of that, I think, is extraordinary because, A, it doesn't take that much time, and secondly, it totally illustrates what he's trying, the points he's trying to make, and he doesn't have to write a long rebuttal where you go back and forth. He just says, uh, he, I don't think he says this is bullshit, but I think he says pointed remarks about what he's doing. Another annotation 
thing for, for me was just in the old days, I would print out, especially when I was doing investigative, I'd just print out a document of a story that was a draft and go through it and write on it and think about it. So internal as opposed to external. And of course, we had another word for that. It's called editing. And we did that a lot, more than we do today. And when groups of people got together uh, to edit projects, especially, uh, well, that, that was, we, we could have called that a cluster blank at times, but also uh, a very messy but valuable system. Now we can coordinate that better with these tools. And when we start to invite the public, it's where it really gets interesting to me and where I think that journalism could get its most productive use of these technologies. Lots of things we're seeing today, you'll see in another minute, but uh, I don't think we've given our audiences, former audiences, now collaborators, if we do it right, the opportunity to help us do better journalism. This is the great opportunity for me. This is where I think we can uh, do extraordinary work if we care to, and I want to see journalists do it. The inviting the public in has issues uh, because doing it at scale, as someone pointed out, I think it was Ed earlier, that uh, annotation at scale can be a giant mess. Uh, it could be trolled and it can be problems in other ways. How we're gonna moderate, that's another interesting question. I hope the tools get easier and better for that. The public can get involved in a more limited way and there are interesting projects like Dan Frumkin's work that he's been doing with John and, and others at Hypothesis. Uh, you'll, I'm, I think you'll probably hear more about that. You don't need to hear it from me. The question on annotation for error correction is whether the error will get corrected. Uh, journalism organizations have not been all that interested in pointing out their own mistakes. One of the projects we're working on with one of our news organizations aims to shift that exactly around. We want them, and they really want, to be owning their mistakes publicly because they believe and we believe that this will enhance trust. We all screw up as journalists because it's a deadline-driven business. If we explain our mistakes, not just correct them, but explain how they happen and then chase them so to make sure that there's limited damage, I think that's going to enhance the kind of trust that journalists have to regain and there's not that many ways to do it and that's one element of transparency that can help. There's a, another part of journalism we don't talk about too much in journalism, which is acts of journalism from people who will never be journalists and those go on all the time. We have a neighborhood mailing list where we live where acts of journalism take place all the time, though they wouldn't be called that in a standard traditional way. I think annotation could help us figure out what's going on in the community better and help us solve community issues that uh, used to be more difficult to do. I haven't thought it all the way through, but this, this feels like the right tool for that job, as well as bigger investigative things. Finally, in the journalism education world, I think annotation has a huge potential. And one online course that I'm part of on news literacy, we plan to incorporate annotation into that course. Uh, I haven't figured exactly out uh, how we're going to do that, but it is right, it's on the drawing board because we think for helping people understand how the process works and what they can do to make it better, this is almost a perfect tool. So those are just a few ideas and I need to uh, move this further along, but again, I, I'm, uh, I'm here really mostly to learn from you folks and uh, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, fun room to talk to. Um, I am 
a tool builder. Um, I have built uh, two major tools for journalism at this point. Uh, one is called Overview. It's an open source document mining system uh, that is now used in investigative journalism. Uh, another is called Workbench. I'll show you a picture of that today. Um, but the reason that's relevant to annotation is because as a tool builder, one of the things I've had to do is figure out how to get people to use my tools. This turns out to be difficult. Now, right? Um, now we're all, you know, here in uh, in sort of surrounded in the tech world, so we understand that adoption is this problem that that new products and, and startups face. Um, I want to talk about some successes and some failures uh, in getting tools adopted in journalism. Um, uh, so I've, I've titled this Changing Journalism Workflows for Transparency. Um, you know, you could also just call this Getting Journalism Metadata Produced. Um, that's really what I'm going to talk about. All of the things that aren't the story. And this isn't the story part, is the problem. Because to be in the journalism business, you have to publish the story. You don't have to publish anything else. Lots and lots of, of news organizations don't, right? So how do you get people to do what to them seems like extra work. It turns out there are ways to do this. Um, this is a uh, platform called Document Cloud. It was created in 2010 by um, uh, Scott Klein at ProPublica, Aaron Pilhofer, then at the New York Times, and others. Uh, and it's a, um, how many of you know Document Cloud, by the way? Okay, great. Um, what you might not know is that there was a hidden agenda. Document Cloud was uh, sold to journalists as a place that would ingest their source material in whatever weird format they got it in, OCR it if necessary, had a bunch of collaboration tools, search, annotations, right? Um, which are both internal and external, right? Because if you're collaborating on investigation, you want to highlight what you found. Uh, and then to publish embeddable um, uh, documents in the final story. But the ulterior motive was, how do we get journalists to share all this amazing material? Right? You file a FOIA request, you get 10,000 pages back, and then it just sort of goes into a black hole, unless we can convince people to upload it. So that was explicitly the strategy, to provide some other type of value that would then entice journalists to share their material. Uh, and um, as we can tell, because everyone knew it, uh, it succeeded. Sometimes this is a lot harder to do. Um, the New York Times has maintained uh, an index, that is to say, uh, article level metadata since 1851. Um, and um, some of this is available online, and to, you know, or you can actually go to the paper volumes in a library. And uh, what it is basically is it's a, it's a synopsis of the article, you know, a sentence or two, uh, plus a bunch of tags. So subject tags and what we would today call entity tags. Um, this is created, obviously, um, by hand for a very long time. Uh, as you might imagine, um, there are now machine learning systems and so forth that do the article tagging. Uh, but actually, it's still a very manual process. So there's still a team of, I, I think today it's five people. It's, it's varied over the years. Five full-time people who uh, generate the metadata for every single article. Think about that, right? That's, that's, that's not only is that expensive, but it begs the question, why aren't the reporters doing this? Um, and uh, there was an experiment that the Times did in 2015, which I think is very revealing. Um, they built this system. Um, there's a nice little video of this online. It's called Editor. It came out of the R&D lab. And um, as you type, it does entity recognition and uh, suggests tags, right? So the idea is that as the reporter is entering the story, the, the computer is suggesting annotations. Um, this never got built into the New York Times um, CMS. Uh, in fact, in many news organizations, um, journalists don't compose their stories in a CMS. Uh, very often they just write them up in Microsoft Word and then email them to the editor who, um, you know, 
uh, writes comments in line without even the word annotation uh, function, mails them back, and then eventually it gets mailed to some poor web producer who has to copy the whole thing into WordPress and fix the markup, right? So, th the, so this is the reality of where we are. You could imagine that this system would be a lot more effective if it was actually built into the authoring environment. Um, so I would say that uh, it would be, I think in this room many people think of annotation uh, as a tool. Um, instead, uh, maybe think of it as an integration into the tools they're already using. It would be a lot more likely to, to get used. Um, by the way, uh, hand-built metadata is still, uh, still the, the norm rather than the exception um, uh, in any news organization that produces article metadata. So uh, if you go to major news websites and view the page source, you'll see schema.org, you'll see Facebook Open Graph. A lot of them have annotations. They're mostly hand-built still. Um, for example, the Associated Press has um, a team uh, which maintains a set of over 200,000 hand-built classification rules. So although they use a classifier to suggest the tags, they're continually updating that classifier and watching the output. This is my current project. Um, this is a, a data journalism tool called Workbench. Um, and the idea here is, um, we want to build a data journalism process where transparency and reproducibility is just a side effect. It's built in. Um, so the, the, the basic idea is old. You can see it's sort of this, this modular stacking operations together. Um, what is less obvious from this picture is that if you, the, the little spreadsheet view on the, the bottom right there, uh, if you start editing that, say you change a cell value or you sort it, it actually adds a module that does the operation. Uh, so you, you actually can't do data work without producing a, a transparent and reproducible record of what it was that you did. Um, and so while transparency is a major goal of the project, um, uh, that's not the promise that we were making to journalists. The, the promise that we're making to journalists is this is a way to do uh, more sophisticated data processing tasks uh, without coding. So think of it as somewhere between like Excel and a Jupyter Notebook, right? It sort of, it sort of fits in that spot between. Uh, in particular, it automates a lot of these things that um, sort of the unsexy parts, right? The, the scraping, the, um, you know, keeping track of versions, um, you know, connecting to your Google Drive and getting the data and, um, you know, doing name standardization and then pushing it off to the front end and, and so forth. But that's the, that's the value, right? So my, my theory is that the only way you're going to get annotation uh, actually ingrained in journalism workflows is by making it an add-on to something else which provides tremendous value uh, to the, for the things that they're already doing. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. So, uh, I am in violent agreement with John, with what Jonathan is saying about, about uh, annotation needing to be something that's invisibly integrated into the fabric. I'm not loud enough? Okay. Um, so I, I did some research over the last couple of months into how the fact-checking ecosystem works. PolitiFact, Snopes, factcheck.org, um, all of them now under the covers are publishing metadata. And that metadata is there to enable the search engines um, in particular Google, to be able to label stuff. And so the idea is, uh, you know, if a claim has been checked and PolitiFact has rated it as a four Pinocchios or whatever their scale is, um, then when Google sees that search result, they should be able to paint a label on it. Um, what you will actually find, and I encourage you to try this, is if you go to PolitiFact or factcheck.org, um, pick a fact-checking story, uh, grab the text of the claim that's been checked, put it into Google, what you will see almost certainly as the first search result is the PolitiFact story, right? So the label is on the PolitiFact story and it says this is a PolitiFact story and it was a fact check and it rated it for Pinocchios, which is pretty tautological, right? Because what you really want to have happen is you want the target of the fact check to be the thing that gets labeled and all of the echoes of that target to be the things that get labeled. 
and, um, and those labels don't appear on, you know, if it was a Breitbart story or some, someplace else, or, you know, the labels aren't making it to the places where they ought to be attached. And the reason for that is that those target URLs are not in the metadata that's being published by PolitiFact and factcheck.org. Um, and uh, being a longtime tool builder and student of what gets adopted and not, I looked into it and sure enough, as you can guess, right, these, these busy reporters who uh, are trying to post four times a day and make the page view counters spin and looking at, to the right and the left and seeing people missing from seats that used to be occupied yesterday, um, are now being asked to fill out a form in addition to everything else that they're doing that, that, that brings this information. And so you can probably not be surprised to know that it's not happening uh, very consistently. And actually, we actually know this because Dan Whaley and I were at a meeting a couple of weeks ago and we met with Google and Bing product managers who are slurping up this what's called schema.org metadata. Um, and they said, yeah, we would love to be able to paint labels on the targets of these claims. It's, you know, the information's not there. It's not in the metadata, right? So, uh, you know, back to the question of, well, well why not, right? And it, it comes down to really stupid, mundane kinds of things. But, um, you know, the two essential ingredients for this to work are the claim, which is typically, uh, let's say, a statement in a document, um, and the URL of the document that that statement lives in, right? So at some point, some journalist, I guarantee, already visited that document already made a selection and so implicitly identified that metadata, right? But it wasn't captured at that point um, and it wasn't brought automatically into the workflow. So that's the kind of an opportunity that I'm pursuing with these folks and we're not there yet. Um, you know, we actually have not broken into newsrooms in a way that would um, make this stuff work the way it, it wants to, but I, I can share a, a little bit of a success story that gives you some insight into the reality of getting this stuff to happen. So, um, Hypothesis um, has for a long time been closely associated with an organization called Climate Feedback, who are uh, a coalition of climate scientists who have been annotating and verifying and fact-checking climate change stories in the mainstream press. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been talking about them every year at I Annotate since I joined Hypothesis three years ago. Um, they're kind of a poster child use case, and so the idea is, you know, you go to the New York Times or the Breitbart story, and you see the expert lens of a team of climate scientists overlaid on the information that you're reading, right? So you're looking at this through the eyes of an expert, which is what I think I'll, I'll, clearly we all want in every domain, right? So that's all good. Um, but uh, what we found actually in the last six months looking at our, at our internal data is that uh, a lot of the comments from these scientists um, weren't actually happening as annotations, right? So, Because really the work product of climate feedback is the climate feedback website where they synthesize the comments of the set of scientists on a particular article. And so their work product is actually you know, not the annotated page. That's, that's the transparency and accountability piece of this in the background. Their work product is, this, is the site that they build. Um, and um, you know, what I realized when I met with the managing editor is that from his perspective, it didn't make too much difference whether he brought the comments into his website from the annotation layer or whether he just received them in email. Because either way, his workflow was copying and pasting, right? He would copy some stuff and paste some stuff. And, you know, to my point earlier, um, you know, the, the selection that you make in the, in the act of making an annotation is an act of information capture and is an act that results in machine-readable content. And so um, what a pretty simple thing turned out to be was to provide a way for the managing editor at Climate Feedback to be able to export from the annotation layer directly into the WordPress template in the format that his publishing system consumes. So all of a sudden, um, Scott cares. It makes a difference to him because it saves him, you know, and you always want to appeal to enlightened self-interest, right? It saves him now hours of work because he's not copying and pasting anymore. Right? So now it's in his interest to say, like, it really makes a difference to me if you put this information in the annotation layer 
uh, versus emailing it to me, you will save me a lot of time, right? That's, that's the kind of an incentive that we need because the, the knock-on benefits here, which include you know, the transparency, the accountability, the fact that all of these scientists' comments are now in an open and standard and machine-readable format, those are ecosystem benefits. Those are the kinds of things that everyone in the anti-misinformation space understands and wants, but those are not motivating uh, incentives, right? The motivating incentive is, you know, if it takes me uh, 10 minutes to do something and you can give me a way to do the same thing in five minutes, then I'm in, right? And, and so, you know, my question to, to these folks is, you know, how do, we, how do we do more of that, right? How do we make more of that kind of thing happen? I mean, so when I look at the examples that have succeeded, um, what I see is sort of solving a lateral problem, right? So rather than asking, you know, how do I get people to use my annotation layer, um, I think of questions like, uh, what upcoming transformative product uh, would sort of spit out an annotation layer sideways, right? Like, what's, what's the complementary thing? And so I find myself thinking about things like um, uh, Evernote and Zotero and these sort of research tracking systems, right? right? Because th there's a clear um, opportunity there to help journalists keep all of this stuff organized because it's, the research process is just a big mess, right? So if I could um, generate or, or export from Zotero the notes that I had already made while I was reading the documents. Um, that seems a lot more likely than adding me, asking me to, to fill out a form after I've already written a story. Uh, build on that a bit. Uh, if, if the tools I'm already using uh, can incorporate this stuff invisibly to me, that would be a really good uh, way to put this into the, uh, into the uh, world in a way that the journals wouldn't have to notice it and do anything with it. And that leads me to suggest something to all of you who are developing these. About, um, about half, I believe, the news of the newsrooms now in this country use WordPress for a CMS. If you can... Uh, if you can do a plugin uh, to WordPress, you will have made a big difference uh, for whatever it is you're working on. Uh, and something we are working on is what we're calling a uh, transparency toolkit that will be a WordPress plugin. We may be doing it collaborative, collaboratively with another project, but uh, and it's going to be very modular in its architecture. So. It's conceivable that some of this might fit together, but the more invisible is that this will be, I think, the better. The last thing is that authors, a lot of authors I know are using something called Scrivener. How many of you have heard of that? Okay, you must be, you must be authors. Uh, it, it's hard to describe, but it's an astonishing uh, tool set for creating uh, uh, huge, complex documents like books. But it's collecting, as what John was talking about, it's really doing all that collection as you go. I, would, I don't know if Scrivener has thought about this, but they should. Uh, if you want to leave breadcrumbs for how you did what you did, which is part of what these guys are talking about, that kind of thing where it's already being collected is uh, an amazing opportunity. Uh, and, and there are other things that people use to collect stuff. I, I forget the, the, uh, the, the one a lot of people use, but maybe leverage what other people are doing along the way. So Dan, uh, you and I talked a little bit before about um, the benefit or not of what is really in some sense the core and essence of annotation which is that um, a, a statement or a sentence in a document or a segment of audio or video um, becomes a first class object on the web. It, it is identified um, in, in a way that is precise. And uh, with, you know, as part of the anti-misinformation um, campaign that's happening everywhere now with this push for 
transparency and accountability and the push for journalists to show their work, right? So yeah, it seems kind of obvious, right? That if in the research process, the tool that you're doing to gather and organize and marshal the evidence that supports your story um, is then also automatically something that is gonna be able to project that out um, to human readers and project it out to the ecosystem of robots that wanna make sense of this at scale. Um, uh, you know, it, it, well, to take just one, one piece of this, you know, I think you said that, like, from my perspective, right, if I, if I go to PolitiFact, there's a box that says sources, right, and those sources are links, and those links point to documents. But if I'm actually trying to understand what was it in that document that the person took out of it that was the basis of this, you know, citation, I have to, it's work. It's work for me right. as a reader, right? So, I mean, a clear benefit to me is that, you know, if that link took the person to the statement in the document that was the reason the document was cited, right, then that's better for me as a reader, but you were kind of skeptical about that. I'm not skeptical about the idea, just about uh, whether it's going to add to do what you want is going to add a lot of work for them that they may not feel they have time for. That's all I would suggest. And that's exactly my point, right? If, if by definition, in the course of doing the research and evidence gathering, you visited those documents, you selected those statements, and you squirreled them away in your own personal information management system, or you squirreled them away in Slack or somewhere else, right? It's, it, I think it's no more work, right, if that stuff is managed in an annotation layer that is potentially public, that is machine readable, that is standard, right? It, it's the same work in a different context, but I, it's difficult to make that case. But do they have the right tool to do that? No. Therefore, it's more work. <laughs> right, it, it's really hard to get around the, the more work problem. Um, and I think we're all sort of imagining a sort of more integrated tools universe. Um, that, that's a very hard thing to build, right? Uh, so one of the things that um, in some of my data work uh, I discover is missing is um, from a research point of view, we don't actually have very good descriptions of what it is that journalists do. Um, I, did a, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago called What Do Journalists Do With Documents? And the only thing I did was I documented um, using a few dozen case stories, you know. So a journalist gets this pile of uh, documents from a FOIA request, right? Or do they get it from FOIA request? I, I documented where do they usually get it from, how many pages is it, what format does it come in, and then are they searching for something in particular? Do they just want uh, sort of a thematic breakdown? Um, are they doing it collaboratively? Do they need to publish the documents? Are they able to publish the documents because there's privacy and legal and security concerns. Um, it was just sort of a, kind of an ethnography of, of the process. And uh, I've never seen anything like that for uh, the annotations that reporters already make. So lacking that, I don't even know how to design this hypothetical tool because I don't know what journalists are doing yet. Uh, so I think we're actually quite a long way away from figuring out how to solve this problem. I, 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 uh, you're describing, the journalist you're describing is a rare breed okay. these days of who has time to collect uh, the open records and then figure out uh, how to analyze stuff, whether if it's electronic or whether you have to OCR it or whatever from, from a PDF. I'd like to also think about the, the, the people in most cases doing uh, news uh, these days who are so uh, constrained for time and as a result tend to do things that are a lot shallower than we might like, certainly than I would like. Annotations, the opportunity to make it deeper after the original publication, it's, an, it's one of the opportunities. Again, I would like to see this happen and tools that would help do that at scale and in ways that won't be radically gamed by bad actors would help us a lot, I think, in our communities uh, because then some, you know, a one interview story is common. What if we could 
use annotation to deepen that, now you'd need the understanding from the journalists involved that this is a good thing, as opposed to an interference with their role. But I think they're getting that uh, more and more. So I, I, I think this has potential for uh, maybe helping to reverse one of the terrible trends that's going on in a time when people are being uh, laid off in bigger and bigger numbers at news organizations and where people are trying to do journalistic things uh, with other limitations where we could collectively build more depth and breadth into what we see. So you're both in the unique situation of being able to, because you teach journalism, influence the next generation of journalists. And so you bring this perspective to your teaching. What's the opportunity there? What's the experience been? Oh no, you've asked a question that I haven't already thought about the answer to. Um, so, so, you know, coming from the data journalism side, um, show your work is this, is this maxim. Uh, and um, the, the forms that we have to do that haven't really evolved. Uh, so the forms we have are basically the, the nerd box, uh, which is uh, slang for, you know, the little, it, it literally was like a, a box in the paper, right? The, the methodology box, um, which now has sort of evolved into the methodology post and uh, the GitHub repo. Um, and we're starting to see it improve things a little bit. Jupyter Notebook has improved things tremendously. Um, what we don't really have yet and what we don't really teach yet is a... Um, the, the form and style and conventions of uh, the methodology post, right? So we have very old, long-standing conventions for the actual story, like the inverted pyramid, like, you know, use their last name only after first reference. We've got all of these rules. We don't really have rules about, okay, so when you're showing how you did this data analysis, you start with the top by providing a hyperlink to the original source of the data, and then you have a paragraph that says what this data is supposed to show, and then you have you know, a link to the code, with, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, people have tried to build these templates. There's a few floating around, but there's no um, sort of a consensus or, or, or discourse around well, what, is this, what does this look like? Um, and if we did have a little more standardization, then we could start to routinize that process. It makes it much more amenable to uh, building workflow tools. So you're teaching that, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so uh, let's, let's converse. <laughs> Hey, um, really love all these thoughts. I think just a thought, I want to see your initial reaction to it, but I think, um, I'm sorry for the feedback. Uh, I think uh, in, in order to make these things as easy to use as possible, I think that clipboard is the natural place for this because people are already copying and pasting text and there's some new clipboard APIs um, that allow us to extract structured data, which we could then copy and paste into editors. Uh, and just wanted to get your thoughts on, on such, such a workflow of just using the straight up clipboard API to, to paste data. So, you know, for what it's worth, my, my notion here, the thing I'm actually pitching to newsrooms right now is that um, a thing never needs to be copied and pasted, right? Because the selection that you make of some piece of evidence, some piece of content, um, which is you know, either material to the story that you're writing or is just ancillary to it, right? But it's part of the breadcrumb trail, right? Um, that that selection that you make is the capture event in this pipeline, right? And that that information is now available in the annotation layer, you know, in as public or private a way as it needs to be, but in a standard and machine readable form, right? That can flow through the rest of the process without ever being copied and paste it. So I actually take your point about clipboard structured information exchange in general, but in this particular case, I want to abolish copying and pasting, actually. I think we, I think we should put that behind us. <laughs> the bio curators are like, yeah! <laughs> Is there a question 
here? Yeah, I have a question, and it has to do with, I think, maybe the t what I see is some tension between what you're describing, John, and maybe what seems to me part of the structural business model for many online journalism institutions. So if my business model is based on advertising revenue or clicks or number of visits to my site, I, I have actually a disincentive to link someone away from my site to view a source or to view something that doesn't stay in my ecosystem. So what you're describing sounds good, but I don't know whether if I'm already worried about losing my job or job security or hits to the articles that I'm publishing, whether I could even be persuaded to include metadata to the sources or the references that were not originated with my organization in that workflow. And I wonder whether you have some thoughts or ways to think through or work around that, that potential structural problem in journalism. We've, we've, in journalism, we've been going back and forth for a long time about linking. Uh, it's ridiculous that people still, and the, but it's not very many people at this point who don't link out because people understood that that's stupid to pretend that you're the final place and that, you know, a lot, there's some pretty good business models that have been built on sending people away. Uh, we all know who the primary one is. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, unconcerned about that as a business issue. And one thing we, uh, it's, cert it's still kind of a hypothesis, forgive the expression here, um, that sending people away, that linking out, that showing sources, that uh, providing documents and on and on will increase uh, trust of the right kind and engagement of the right kind such that the business will be better off in the long run. There, there's no data that I'm aware of on whether that's true and one of the things we're all working on is to start, is to get into the research to see if that is the case. And, and I firmly believe it is. So I have a question to stay with the topic of uh, revenue sources. Um, I think he mentioned how uh, advertising model is not, very, not really working and a lot of publishers are switching over to the subscription model. Um, what do you think about using the um, annotation and the metadata as another layer in the subscription service, possibly like a tiered layer? So you have the regular subscription service where you get access to the articles but then you have like a higher layer, higher level subscription where you can actually see like the notes and the, how the journalists arrive to their paper through that process. So you kind of get like the behind the scene view of how journalists did their work. Kind of like uh, the, getting a view of the sausage making process, I suppose. <laughs> well, that's a well, that's kind of a fascinating idea. Um, I wonder who the customer is who would pay for that extra information, um, and I think that it starts to go towards uh, researchers, um, sort of market research, trade publications, uh, finance, sort of that universe of stuff. Um, and there are publications that um, cater to those markets that. The trade publication uh, world is quite large um, and um, employs, I suspect, a majority of the people who might describe themselves as its journalists. Um, so maybe that's uh, a product that they could look for. Um, having said that, the value add of a reporter is to provide a trustworthy summary of a variety of different sources. So really what you're paying for is the, the to not read the process in most cases. Um, so my instinct is that it would be a difficult um, product to sell. A question here? Yeah. Um, Dan Gilmore said, my readers know more than I do. I know the solution of the New York Times uh, and you know that before there was a digital object identifier. 
you remember the DOI. The question is, you can measure the information. Do you remember that the words are, uh, the words, sounds and imagine are a various form of our mind? You can measure the information that is a virus. You know the problem of longitude. You know John Harrison. Sorry for my English. It's, it's not your English, it's the echo. I, I, I apologize, I, I'm not understanding. I didn't understand because of the echo in the room. I, I, ah, I just. Okay. I repeat. Come on up. <laughs> we'll repeat it. This is handy. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, it starts with something I said a long time ago, which is that my readers know more than I do, which was my mantra for many years and always was true. Um, so the, the DOI, what was that? Oh, I don't remember the DOI. Um, how to measure the information. Can you measure the, measure the information? Uh, you know, I use machine learning to identify the nature of the information. Is that what you're asking? Could, per, perhaps we could have a conversation at lunch, yeah. and, yes. and I'll, uh, I'll report back. Uh, thanks. So hi, right, right here. Um, so I guess my question is a little bit about something a couple people have, have touched on, which is the idea of bad actors. I feel like we have a community you have a community of people that are sort of motivated to improve um, the quality of a particular statement or to find the veracity of it. There's a larger community of people that are interested in finding out about what the experts are saying about something. Um, but I feel like the history of the web has been the promise of opening things and then the reality of, of uh, the well getting poisoned by um, people for various reason, reasons trying to disrupt that, that process. And I've, I feel like lately that's been a, um, a more critical, uh, critical path for things. Um, so what's, I guess my question is, what do you do to try and combat that with the idea, if the idea is that by creating an, uh, a, a, a framework and tools and a process that improves uh, the reliability of the information, how do you protect that from people for various motivations trying to disrupt that? I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, and to, to the point that Ed Bice was making earlier, the work that we've been doing with the Credibility Coalition is aimed squarely at being able to, at scale, combat bad actors and misinformation. Um, and you know, so we can all imagine ways in which Indicators are flowing through the information ecosystem that enable those who choose to opt in to the kinds of lenses that they trust to verify what they're reading can do so, right? And um, we can also imagine that those same mechanisms are going to enable the Facebooks of the world to get a better automated handle on, this, on the viral spread of the misinformation, right? So, I mean, that's, you know, metadata is intrinsically boring. Uh, right, but what, what we just described is not boring, it's essential, right? And so this is why we have to crack the nut, right? We, you know, because, because anti-misinformation mechanisms at scale depend on metadata, right? That metadata has to flow through 
the production process. We've talked a lot here about what are the obstacles to that, um, but you know we have to crack that nut. You know we've got you know, that that that's that's what we're trying to do, in, in my opinion. Okay, we're going to take just one last question because the food truck is actually here and is getting set up. So we want to eat lunch. Oh wow, that's that's a lot of pressure. Sorry. Um, Hold the mic up to your. Face I like over. this. Okay. Um, so I think what part of the DOI question, and this is a question that I've often had with journalists and journal articles in general, and I come from bio curation world, um, so we have a lot of documents that have a digital object identifier. Um, that digital object identifier identifies that article in whatever format on whatever website it is in, right? So it is a permanent record identifier for that object. Now these things don't seem to exist in journalism. And so you might comment on something and then the website that you're commenting on poof and disappears or you know the the version of that article moves somewhere else now the URL is different those comments are gone. Right? So this is kind of a problem that's I think intrinsic in journalism. It's cool to see that you know New York Times has these huge indices, but I wonder how document identification happens uh, in the New York Times or you know whatever other website. Can I have just a quick the um, the other part of that is that in John your workflow, if you have the page that is annotated automatically saved in the web archive so that you don't have to worry about this? Yeah, that's, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> okay. There we go. Um, so how are documents uniquely identified in journalism? The answer is idiosyncratically. Um, uh, every news organization has their CMS. Um, some of these are very well organized and very old, like the New York Times. Um, the Associated Press used, uses internally this 11-digit string. I mean, these IDs do exist, but there's always this mapping from the internal archive to um, the external website. And in fact, the Times just did this project to move a bunch of stuff from nytimes.com to archive.nytimes.com. And it was this huge problem because you had to fix up all of the hyperlinks and uh, images and so forth. Um, part of the issue here is that um, as opposed to academic publishing, where a huge part of the value of the publisher is the preservation, uh, because you know, uh, you know, uh, you read stuff that's decades old all the time. Uh, most of the value of news is within the first day or two of the article being published. So there's not as much um, incentive to really nail down the archive and make it really good. Uh, it's an expensive thing to do, as you know. So honestly, uh, I am, as um, the other commenter pointed out, I'm, I'm much more hopeful that things like the Internet Archive uh, will ultimately be the solutions to these types of problems. Thanks.